leading. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are one of the leading entities in the world, really trying to apply the uh, deep technical capacity of digitalization data um, and also blockchain to actually uh, save our planet. And here you can see there's a very busy slide on the left are some of the awards we've won. So we were very lucky to have awards from the UNDP, from City Foundation, from the Song Qingling, um, one of the sort of founding uh, leaders of China's kind of foundation, uh, Microsoft, and also Swire, which is a largest, uh, one of the largest uh, Hong Kong property groups. And then some of the logos of companies that we've worked with and also um, uh, helped become carbon neutral or building technology for are located on the left, on the right-hand side. So they like Schneider Electric, uh, which was voted the most sustainable company in the world in 2020, to DBS, Veolia, the largest environmental services company in the world, uh, WWF, uh, TED, Asia Society, Mizuho, uh, and several, several other groups. Um, we've been uh, lucky to have awards at Forbes and also at uh, Tatler, which are kind of, uh, I guess, like, you know, startup related, youth kind of leadership related activities. So um, we've been very lucky to actually get some of the words we've been doing recognized. Um, and yeah, so next slide. Um, and, you know, very lucky to work with Yungo and uh, Koi. So in uh, Koi, uh, in, in COP26, uh, actually, we uh, were able to exhibit some of the creations we've done digital work-wise. Uh, our cell was featured on the Google Arts and Cultures page. And also we helped create the calculation for a lot of the youth delegates as they arrive from different parts of the world to, uh, to uh, no, not Madrid, to um, Glasgow in 26. Uh, and hopefully actually on the course of this presentation, as we get to know you guys, you know, I really believe that the Yungo community is actually one of the most amazing internationally driven uh, kind of climate leadership communities. Um, and uh, there's a lot of exciting things we can do with you guys um, and you know, kind of plan in advance for COP27. And we actually have some pretty exclusive events, pretty high level invitations with like politicians and uh, government leaders that we'll tell you more about. So it's a great chance for you guys actually to think about how to sort of participate um, in the next COP coming up. Um, next slide. Uh, there's a bit of uh, clicking sound. I think it's coming from Schmel. So maybe Schmel can mute. I'll help him mute. Um, so Maybe we start with um, the blockchain and uh, maybe just in the chat here, can everyone just write a sentence if you're convenient? Can you share a sentence about what your thinking of the blockchain is right now? Like, what is it? What does it represent? Do you think it's a, a force for good? Do you think it's a force for evil? Just maybe write your one sentence summary into our group chat. I'll pause for a second. Digital Ledgers says uh, Tuarita. Maybe some comments from Jonathan. Uh, Elliot says transparent systems. Hafiz, maybe love to get your comments. Um, Katrina, Xiu Yang. This is also just to make sure that you guys are um, are um, paying attention. Yeah, a force for good, but it must be managed to be so. Great, I love that answer. More people, conduit for crypto transactions. Okay, great. One more, waiting for one more answer and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue to the next part. Uh, anyone else? Okay, uh, we'll, 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 we'll sort of continue with you guys. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at this um, in more detail. Um, do we have another slide here? Yeah. So basically, um, first let's start with the technology and then we can start with the implications. So, you know, I used to do data science and machine learning. That was my kind of official trade. I was paid as a data scientist. I, I sort of graduated and worked in that industry. And data science is actually, you know, a, a powerful transformative tool, but it is um, an efficiency technology. So what you used to do with 10 people, you can do with one person and an algorithm, or you can do with you know, one person and a robot. And so a lot of the key societal questions that come from AI and automation are what happens to people, right? What are you gonna pee the jobs of people in the future if we actually remove people's jobs? 
So that's the kind of key question mark that people have. Now with blockchain, it's very different. Blockchain is not an efficiency technology. In fact, because of the way it's decentralized and consensus driven and voting, it actually requires um, a bit of um, challenge uh, of getting people together. You know, it's kind of like having a Zoom meeting. It takes us so long to coordinate, having to get everyone you know, in the same rooms. So you can imagine how difficult it is to actually navigate. And especially when there's money at stake, right? If you guys ever have a, a situation where you're eating with your friends, you have to decide who's gonna pay the bill, how much, it can be like 30 minutes just for like $5. So the blockchain overall is not efficiency technology. It is a social technology and it is an economic technology, but more than anything else, it is an incentive technology. And what I mean by that is that using the blockchain, you can actually create the rule book for who gets rewarded when and how based on their actions. And that actually is super powerful. This is precisely why I think there's an opportunity to use blockchain effectively in climate change around the world, because we have the ability through the blockchain to change people's behavior as it relates to sustainability, as it relates to climate change, and as it relates to actually all of the lives that we are living right now. So inside the blockchain, there's something called an NFT. And I'm sure you guys have heard about NFTs already. So synchronously, <coughs> while I'm talking, I'd love to just have you again spit out your one sentence uh, impression of what an NFT is. Good, bad, you know, whatever you can think of is a word association. I'm just going to continue talking. So an NFT is actually, for me, a really fascinating um, technology stack because it actually creates an opportunity for something that the world has never seen before which is the opportunity to create something that is a digital, scarce, digitally native, scarce object. In the early days of the internet, you know, the people who were really pissed off that we actually invented the internet at all were the music industry, the movie industry, the book industry, because it actually allowed people to send around copyright material for free and not have to pay $400, $300 for a particular you know, record or a book, like a library book. For college students, the internet has been the best cost-saving tool that's ever invented because you don't need to download or you don't need to pay for any textbooks anymore. Now, what we are looking at right now is uh, an opportunity to give value back to digital creators. And that is actually one of the key um, innovation points about um, what, the, what the, um, the NFTs represent. So NFTs, again, just for the sake of simplicity, are ways that are going to do uniqueness, transparency, ownership, interoperability, and finally, traceability. And you can do NFTs for a lot of different things. You can do NFTs for um, your artistic creation. You can also do NFTs for carbon. You can do NFTs for legal paper documents, for you know, movie rights, and basically anything that is a digital object, you can become an NFT. Now, the reach and scale of this has so far been restrained to mostly the art world. But as we'll see in the presentation, there's opportunities to use this as a powerful tool to actually mobilize people to build community and also to stop climate change. Um, next slide. So let's touch on the environmental prospect. And this is actually where Haviz, is, uh, his, his comments are leading us into the next section. People have heard about the environmental impact NFTs a lot. There's been so much press around the negative environmental impact of NFTs. But part of the presentation that we're going to try to do today is really to discuss the actual science behind this and not really be caught up in the newspaper headlines, but actually focus on specifically the rules. And the rules of it are very simple. There are essentially two major forms of existence of blockchains. There's something known as uh, a proof of work system and something known as a proof of stake system. And these two things are very different. Um, so the proof of work system um, is one where people have to spend a lot of compute power actually to create um, proof of, uh, to create a, a particular hash. And this hash represents the uh, symbol of the work they did. Um, actually, in our current daily life, proof of work actually is a very useful concept. I use it all the time in my life. For example, like uh, when you're arguing with your boyfriend or girlfriend and they're mad at you and you have to do something to make them feel better. If you just um, give them $20, they're going to be even more mad at you. They say, what are you doing? Like, you don't value, you know, like, suppose, like, you're, they're late for dinner. You give them $20. They say, you value my time like money? That's, that's terrible. It's the worst 
way to insult your, 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 your romantic other. But if you cook them a really nice dinner, it takes you two hours. You have to go get groceries, supplies, you like serve them, then they feel very loved. And it's because you've shown that you've used the most expensive thing you can have, your time, to do something that you can't buy anywhere else. And that's proof of work, right? That dinner is proof that you've actually put in the work. So in the blockchain system, proof of work is something similar, but in, in most cases, it turns out to be requiring your computers to do a lot of computational work. And this is why people have been saying that there's a lot of carbon emissions attached to blockchains and NFTs, because the actual compute cycles of proof of work actually cost a lot of energy. And that energy, if it's not green, if it's coal energy, if it's you know, natural gas, it has carbon emissions. And that carbon emissions is what people calculate. Now there's another system called proof of stake. And proof of stake is a chain that doesn't require the computational work. Proof of stake actually allows you to run the entire blockchain with as much energy as sending emails around. And that's really powerful. And there are several blockchains today that use proof of stake and their carbon emissions are actually quite negligible. So I'll give you a very specific example. There's a project called Solana and Solana's calculation of their proof of stake energy system for the entire network, which at one point was worth, let's say 30 billion US dollars, was roughly the energy expenditure of 1,000 US homes for one year. So that's it. For $30 billion, all of the energy combined to power that network was just 1,000 people's homes in one suburb in, in US. And so the proof of stake system is actually where all of the energy savings is going to come from. And if you were to do NFTs on proof of stake, you can be comfortable that most of your energy emissions are, are negligible. It's probably as, you know, the Zoom call probably is more energy than the um, than the proof of stake. So this is a very easy distinction, right? After you heard me talk about this, you guys probably feel like a little bit, you know, better about this whole situation. But what for me, and you know, as we build this alliance, right, and why we have these calls, actually is we want to educate young people to know the difference between the two. So then we don't actually completely ignore or even condemn blockchain technology. Instead, we use it as an enabler, as now a secret weapon that allows young people around the world to have the same amount of power voting rights, voice, and representation as the old people of the world. This is the opportunity ahead of us in the next few minutes here on this call, but also in the next few years ahead of you guys. So next slide, please. So the question is, how do we use NFTs for sustainability, right? We're sort of bringing all these concepts together. So let's go continue. Well, um, we have an entity called Project Arc, and Project Arc is actually named after the biblical story of Noah's Ark. So I know there's many denominations and, and people here. Um, uh, I recognize that. Um, for many people who grew up in the West, you know, the story of Noah's Ark is a popular children's novel about um, you know, how uh, Noah saved two animals of every kind um, inside this big boat he built. And as we looked at the problem in our case, we actually were terrified by the loss of biodiversity that was happening under our eyes right now. We're actually living through the sixth largest extinction event in the entire fossil record of the earth. The earth has had five large extinction events where a lot of animals just died. And uh, one of them was caused by you know, the asteroid <coughs> that hit the dinosaurs. There was also like uh, plague systems. There's many other sort of temperature ch changes dramatically. But this is the first mass extinction event that's completely driven by all of the people living on the planet. Like our existence is causing the extinction event. And that is terrifying. And so we wanted to find a way to actually create a, a, a mission to save the animals. And that's what we called it Project Arc. And from Project Arc, we actually were one of the first people in the world to actually issue NFTs for the WWF. And some of you guys have heard of WWF before. The WWF is one of the world's largest and most international um, conservation groups. They have 100 chapters around the world. And these chapters each run programs to make sure they're local enabler that um, is um, is able to drive the change. So Hafiz is working with WWF Pakistan, fantastic. You know, and something I want to hear more about in the near future. And uh, Katrina is saying that uh, we destroy ourselves in the long-term for our short-term goals. Yeah, it's, it's, this is the short-sightedness that we're struggling against and where we think that uh, better incentive design actually can make a big difference. Uh, what's our next slide here? So as we look at how we use NFTs to make a difference, um, ARC, uh, I sent a link in the website. There's a, there's a lot of content there you guys can check out and I'll just leave you guys to read at your own time. But one of the key things that come out of our work at ARC actually is to recognize that there's many stories inside Impact that are told, uh, that could be told. And some of them are told um, right now and some of them uh, are told waiting for you to actually tell them. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, Hafiz is gonna be one of, a, one of our key tellers. 
The idea is that we want to actually look at all 17 of the sustainable development goals and actually use NFTs to represent impact behind them. So a key example would be like children education, right? If we can create NFTs that actually reward people to support their time or their money to build schools or to teach at schools, this actually can be a powerful way to make people who otherwise may not consider to do this on a Saturday morning to feel special about doing it. And that's you know one of the key um, goals on, on SDGs, number four. There's other ones like circular economy. A lot of times we are too lazy to recycle or the city we live in is not set up for recycling and it makes it extra burdensome. If we actually have NFTs that capture the story of recycling or reward people for recycling, we can actually move people along that line. So you can imagine for every one of the 17 SDGs, we can come up with a program or some sort of idea that actually leverages NFTs for those things. So that is one part of impact NFT. The second part is that any impact NFT that wants to be labeled as such needs to be accounting for its carbon footprint. It needs to know what the footprint of the NFT is, and it needs to have done something to reduce it, either through carbon credits, through renewable energy, or some other mechanism. So it's, to me, the simple action of being responsible for your own action. We're not asking you to pay money for other people's misbehavior, but for example, when I fly today, like I intentionally try to offset carbon against my flight. Uh, I enjoy the privilege of being able to fly, but I want to clean up after myself. It's like eating like at a restaurant and, and washing your plate afterwards. You don't want other people to have to wash it for you. So I think this type of simple discipline is one where we actually want to enforce also inside the NFT uh, space as well. And the third one is actually around the activity um, um, is around the activity of the um, uh, uh, of donations. So unlike traditional artworks or stuff where there's kind of an arbitrary sum, we want to actually have a prescribed sum. At least some percentage of your NFT has to go to supporting impact. The bigger the percentage, the better. When we did the WWF work, we actually did 50%. We decided to give 50% of any money we made to the WWF. And you know, we really encourage other people to actually increase it from like a single digit percentage, at least like 10%. You know, we want to encourage people to be more daring in their giving. Actually, it's, uh, um, it, it sort of changes your personality actually for the better. So these are some of the key questions around impact NFTs. We actually have written a more comprehensive paper around it that uh, I will also send a link to. So those guys you're curious, interested, this is actually kind of a 10, 15 page document that sort of goes through these ideas in more detail. But the reason we actually have specifically focused on impact NFTs is because we think not all NFTs are created equal. Some of them are just literally there for a fun cat picture. But for the ones that are serious, the ones that actually wanna do something you know, you know, useful for the world, we wanna have a separate label that then have a standardization body, have an have a authorization that sort of stamps this impact idea. And here is this alliance, the Impact NFT Alliance, which is about 40 something organizations inside already. This is actually gonna be one of the key places that actually gathers this value. Next one. Um, so the, um, the uh, use case and impact. So things that we can do with uh, impact NFTs are one, we can do much more effective carbon accounting and offsetting. Two is we can actually show um, the beauty of wildlife and animals. Three is we can actually create new types of digital land. And here we're actually working with this really interesting country, which I think, you know, for the people on this, on this call, you guys are openly invited to join uh, information, you know, session about this in the near future with the, the, the sort of youth climate leaders of this country. The country is called Suriname, and it is a carbon negative country. It is one of two carbon negative countries in the whole world. And they actually, as a country, draw down more CO2 than they emit. So as a person who's been working on climate change for several years, like, that is so cool. Like, <laughs> like we need more of these countries in the world. So we're actually going to try to popularize and celebrate their, their carbon, carbon negativ negativity through some of the stuff we're creating. And finally, we have this idea of a carbon registry and, and something called CRED, which actually is an incentive scheme for people who spend money supporting carbon credit projects. Most of the people in the world today, if you spend money, you are literally doing a donation. There's nothing else you get out of it. But I think that in order to actually get the next million people or next 5 million people to be carbon negative, we actually need to give them something as a reward. It could be symbolic, it could be you know, non-monetary, but it needs to feel like there's some celebration of their activity, not just a PDF. And so that's something we're working on for CRED as well. 
Um, yeah. So, uh, so here's an example of um, a wildlife NFT where WWF actually used it to raise something like two hundred seventy thousand dollars, and they also got a lot of criticism for it at the same time, which is kind of interesting. Um, because actually, going back to the narrative idea, a lot of people are very convinced without any room for improvement that NFTs overall are bad. And part of why we're having this call with you guys is because we think NFTs, if properly managed, like one of the uh, students there said earlier, um, when properly managed, can actually be quite good. Katrina. So it's about management. We can't be afraid of new technology. Otherwise, we are just like dinosaurs. You know, The point of being young is that we're open-minded. But instead, what we have to do is actually understand the, the danger and make sure that we avoid the danger um, so that we can actually benefit from the, the tools. Yeah. Um, next one. So here is a short story about Suriname. It's actually really fascinating. The Suriname country is covered by 93% forest. So think about any country in the world today. Imagine 93% of the entire country is just rainforest. All of the people live on the very tip of the, of the country that's not forest. So that's really interesting. But uh, unfortunately, because of some very uh, sort of, I would say, short-sighted geopolitics, the recognition of Suriname as a country that's been carbon negative has actually been very slow. And in fact, most of the global north, like people, you know, we hear, you know, have people going to big schools and you know, universities are not taught about Suriname in any meaningful way because people don't believe that uh, Suriname should be getting credit. To me, this is absolutely ridiculous. If a country is actually doing physical measured contributions to reduction of CO2, it should be actually one of the most cherished countries in the world. But the people of Suriname are struggling with poverty. They're struggling with the ability to make ends meet because they have foregone the industrialization that actually brings prosperity at the cost of environmental destruction. And in return, they are living in inconvenient locations. So what we're trying to do with our effort at ARC actually is to change that entire structure. And by using digital assets, we're gonna create incredible artwork that represents the, the, um, um, represents the, uh, the, the uh, culture of Suriname and then bring them actually to the, the present. Um, so I'll also share some of those pictures at the end of this presentation, but we're gonna continue. And, and here is the idea of, of the carbon removal dollar. So uh, in a simple sentence, there is uh, no reward today for buying carbon credits. And what we want to do is create kind of like a visa credit card point system or like an Asia mile point system. Um, there is, um, Uh, there is uh, people who actually hack their entire credit card spending. They actually purposely add or subtract from their credit card bills. They say, oh, I can't buy this TV until next month because I have to like accumulate my point system. People who spend their time optimizing their purchases because of the credit card points. Each credit card point is worth 0.1 cent. Like it's literally not even a cent. It's like one tenth of a cent. But people actually spend so much effort thinking about the, co the points. So what it teaches me and teaches maybe you guys is that actually people respond very well to incentives. So if we can create an incentive system for the removal of CO2, where if you use your, your own hands to remove CO2, you should get 10 cred. If you use your dollars to remove CO2, you should get two cred. If you teach someone about carbon removal and they become educated by the concept, you should re receive 0.1 cred. We'd actually have a hierarchy of social action, including financial and physical and educational that gives people incentives to change their climate behavior. Next slide. So in the, in the context of energy poverty and digital inclusion, um, I'm actually gonna give the floor to Elliot <coughs> for a second. Is he online? Um, I don't know if he is. Okay, yeah, do you wanna say a little bit about this? Cause you, you've had some very cool firsthand travel experience. Maybe just say a little bit about that and uh, yeah. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I may have met some of y'all last week. Uh, just some really quick thoughts on this. For those of you who, ha who haven't heard my, my spiel on this, um, I think that some of the largest problems that plague humanity, especially in the context of climate change, are energy poverty, uh, digital exclusion, and financial exclusion. Um, and for those of you who don't know, energy poverty is basically the 
unreliable or in access to uh, clean energy, clean and reliable electricity. Um, so there's plenty of people in the world that don't have access to any electricity at all. And even those that do, it's unreliable or it's you know, polluting, polluting their air and water and therefore it's not a net good. Um, and then there's something called the digital divide where you know, many people in the world do have access to, to the internet, internet technologies. Um, but there's about 3 billion people on planet Earth today that do not have access to the internet, uh, at least in a reliable way. And then finally, in order to build wealth and um, sort of build, build out local and, and sub-state economies, you need, you need financial inclusion. So you need to be able to access either banking or some, some other types of financial, uh, financial services and instruments. Um, there's, you know, some of you might have heard of something called like microfinance or peer-to-peer -peer finance. Um, this idea that you need, oh, I see a friend of mine, Pedro. Um, but that you need, you need to be able to access these different systems and much of the world doesn't have access to them. Um, and so I was recently in Rwanda attending the uh, ITU's, and some of you might be from the ITU, but I was attending the ITU's uh, Generation Connect Summit along with the world, the WDTC. Um, and I met with some of the, you know, ministers, leaders across the region, uh, talking about where they see Web3 um, as accelerating both, you know, their clean energy transitions and enabling digital and financial inclusion. And so if you think about the world today, for many of us, especially those that are on this Zoom call, we can appreciate that our, our world runs on the internet. Our world runs on electricity. Um, and at least through my, my perspective is that Web3 is an opportunity to recreate the system. It's not like we're expanding the old internet. We're basically building a new internet. And so everybody on this call today has the power to make the new internet one that's inclusive, that is um, fair and uh, promotes the well-being of everybody on, on planet Earth. Um, and so, yeah, that's just like a, a little rant. But I, one thought also is, uh, you know, Max had mentioned proof of work, uh, which is this sort of uh, unique, this gets into the weeds a little bit, but it's this unique um, electricity technology where basically uh, mining, proof of work or crypto mining or even data mining, like a data center, can actually incentivize and make possible clean energy deployment. So if you think about the areas of the world that have the least or have the, have the least amount of energy inclusion, least amount of digital inclusion and least amount of financial inclusion, this, this tends to be you know, areas like Latin and South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia. Um, and as many of you probably also know, these are the areas of the world with the most renewable energy potential. Also, you know, sort of the most young, innovative, and smart people. So I see all these different technologies as, and trends as coalescing, coming together. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just some thoughts. Maybe I could, I could throw it back to you, Max and uh, Irai. Thank you, Elliot. So um, I just want to highlight, you know, Elliot's um, engagement with ITU is so exciting for us because, you know, we sort of think that the internet as a whole, right, is just a, a force of powerful enabling. Right, and if we can actually use the tools of Web3, you know, uh, companies actually to, who are really keen to actually spend money to bring people online, we can actually can drive a lot more economic value to the developing parts of the world and actually give them the financial and technological inclusion that then makes them able parts of the internet. So I also want to introduce a really amazing friend of mine, um, and also you know, classmate of mine and Elliot's uh, called Pedro, who's here on the call. Um, he's a, a special guest. We're having him just, you know, like. We're very lucky to have him just now. Um, uh, this is a presentation to about 24 students around the world who are all climate leaders um, and uh, part of the Young Go organizations, the official youth delegate arm of the UNFCCC. Um, Pedro actually was one time before both a student and also the minister of the youth, um, minister of youth of, of this country, <laughs> of Argentina. And he organized you know, hundreds of students, um, sorry, hundreds of people on his team to, to basically reach you know, hundreds of thousands of students um, and has a lot of leadership experience about what it looks like as a young person actually to take on a position in the government, to talk directly to the country you know, president of, of your country and actually to create change in a meaningful way. Uh, and since then, he's actually now become also a, a, a practitioner of Web3 uh, and is also you know, working on some amazing projects, some of us 
some of the other amazing founders on this use case. So maybe you can spend a few minutes talking about your leadership experience a bit, you know, giving the chance to say, okay, you too, like on the people on the call, you guys are also, you know, have the opportunity to sort of follow in Pedro's steps a bit in the future. And, um, and, uh, and also what you see as the opportunity for Web3 in a social good setting. So. Okay, thanks, Max. And hi, everyone. Um, I think that it's quite exciting that we are spending our Sunday evening trying to change the world and make it a better place to all of us. So I would like to say that I was pretty, why I joined Web3, I came from Argentina, one of the countries with the highest inflation in the world. So there was not another option. Like people are running to crypto because like institutions are not giving the trust to the people. Um, so in Argentina, the conversation around crypto and Web3 is mainstream. It's not something that is related just for a few of people on the top. Um, but I was quite skeptical, I would say, because as someone that did law, someone that always worked for government institutions, I was kind of like wondering, okay, what the heck these guys are trying to do? They are trying to disrupt everything. So that's why I joined Web3 because I wanted to understand, I wanted to do my own deep dive and try to understand which were the futures that we could take from Web3 in order to make a better place. I think that all of us who are right now spending our Sunday evening in this call, we are spending our time here because we don't want, um, we don't want the leadership that we are having currently on the top of different institutions. I think that's one of the biggest problems that we are having as a society. Let's look at the type of leaderships and, and the type of leaders that we are having. They are behaving like, like I would kids. say, like, like kids, kids, right? They are not understanding the tough things that we are facing. Like no one is speaking about the water crisis. No one is speaking about the migration crisis. Like they are just getting around, not like fixing and solving the problems that we have. Um, and sometimes these type of institutions, like let's say like the UN, World Bank, um, sometimes can be a little bit disappointing because can sound or can look like institutions that are very bureaucratical and, and they're not leading or are not driven change. But let me tell you that um, once I used to be in this type of groups working at the UN. And at that time, I remember that I was working with Yahadma. Yahadma is the special and youth envoy for the general secretary of the UN. And we used to be together working in the UN and when we were 18 years old, I think. And then I had the possibility of being, yeah, I became the minister of the youth of, of my country. And I will not say that I, I managed to solve, I would say not even 25% of all the dreams that I had, but at least I learned and I understood that the only way of changing stuff and the only way of, of like really transforming those things that really bother us is like by by getting involved in those revolutions that are transforming the way we live. And Web3 is a revolution that you can be more pro or more against it, but it's happening. And if it's happening, those who are attending this call, who are climate change leaders, should understand what is going on. And for sure, there will be a lot of stuff that we will not be agreeing on what is happening with Web3 the let's say the amount of energy that is consuming or let's say sometimes it seems like a little bit um it seems a little bit um it could it could, it could be like a, an industry that it's only to make money to profit from gambling on on the markets and but i think web3 is way more than that it's, it's going beyond that and that's the exciting revolution that for example project arc is leading and that Impact NFT Foundation is inviting different institutions that were not before engaged in Web3 and are inviting these institutions to be part of because um, we will not take this technology back to what it was maybe two, three, or five years uh, ago. This technology is now transforming many institutions. And I truly believe that um, it, it has a lot of room to, to really bring like innovation within the, within the climate change battle. I think that all of us, we will agree that the most um, challenging and difficult thing to do towards climate change is like bringing more innovation and bringing more capital. If we don't, if we don't attract capital to found um, entrepreneurs and to fund innovative solutions, 
we will not be able to stop climate, the climate disaster. Like countries and institutions are going slower of what actually we need. So we need more innovation, we need more capital, we need more leadership, and we need more technologies. If those technologies at the early beginning of the early stage are not fully uh, aligned with our vision of the world, we should not take them out. We should understand how it's working. We should take entrepreneurs and leaders as Elliot and Max. We should invite them on our own discussions and we should, and we should like demand and we should ask them, okay, how your technology, how your, how your, uh, your startup, how your invention can help us to tackle climate crisis. So um, that's why I joined also Project ARC. I'm a true believer of what we're doing. We need to stay, we, we, of course, like I'm, I'm one of those that are all the time saying to Max, okay, look at this, this I don't like so much, we need to change, we need to improve, um, but they are open to do that. So count on Max to, to bring Web3 into climate crisis and battle. I'm super proud of, of all of you spending their, their Sunday thinking, debating, engaging. And let me tell you one more thing. I think after the pandemic, all of us, we get a little bit annoyed by these endless calls and these endless Zooms. Like we want to be with our friends, party, do our own stuff. But believe me that having a smart and proper networking is like a fundamental and a crucial step for the, the development of your careers. And if you wanna be a politician or if you want to transform big things from institutions, you need to build your network in order to have the key allies worldwide. So this kind of, of initiatives are crucial for, for your career. And we need more people engaging in climate change crisis battles. So yeah, count on us. Beautiful, wow. Round of applause for, for uh, Pedro. Thank you so much um, for that speech. And you can see the, uh, the speech making skills, you know, the, the ability to actually talk to a lot of people and then actually mobilize them for a cause. So um, if you guys are online, while Pedro's still here, because he's about to leave in a second, if you guys um, can turn on your video, we're just gonna take a quick picture um, and then we can uh, finish the rest of this uh, presentation. Are people available to do that? Awesome. I'd love to see your pretty faces around the world. Ooh, nice. Give it one more, two more minutes. Amazing. Uh, Katrina, you've been asking great questions. You should, uh, we should, we'd love to see you on, on, on camera too, if available. I don't know, sometimes bandwidth is an issue. All right, um, we'll wait one minute. Okay, great. So everyone say smile. Three, wait. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, is anyone else gonna turn on? No, okay. Three, two, one, smile. Actually, Shmel, your, your head is showing. She show up. Oh, right okay. One oh, more yeah. time. <laughs> Shmo, you have to lower your camera a little bit. We see the top of your head. We have to see your face. <laughs> okay, all right, great. So um, I, I think it was about to head out, but I actually want to say one thing as we um, as we sort of wrap up here in, in this particular call is like um, we really believe that the students and the young people coming from Yongo are going to be like the leaders of climate movements in their countries, right? And this is actually something that the UN has done really a good job of actually surfacing, you know, these amazing, you know, sort of people. So I actually want to structure an engagement where maybe like once every two months, once every month, we actually focus on leadership development for you guys yeah. about how do you actually accumulate political voice inside your country so that you can actually have the ability to influence. Uh -huh. And we have a living example here. Elliot also has worked for the U.S. government. Um, I've done a little bit of policy work in, in Hong Kong and, and uh, in the U.S. Uh, but there's you know people who actually at 20, 25 years old have become substantial um, uh, you know, people and actually 30 euros have become prime ministers of countries. Yeah. So, so that's going to be. And we could have, we could have Yahadma, um, yeah. the, the special envoy of youth for the UN. I think we could have her engage also. Yeah, perfectly. So that's an open invitation to you guys on this call, you know, as a reward for coming here all this way and spending time, uh, you, you'll be invited to the future session where we actually focus specifically on kind of leadership training and actually strategies to sort of, you know, be able to be very visible. Um, but uh, before that, just thank you so much, Pedro, for coming. Really appreciate uh, your time as well. Um, and uh, in the last maybe five minutes of this call, uh, if we just go back to the slides and just sort of finish the presentation. Be ready if you can uh, open slides again. 
think the presentation has pretty much over. Oh, and, over. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, so, and we can um, we can start the Q and A right yeah. now. Okay, so let's so, do Q and A. Yeah, yeah, and I just want to say a few words. First of all, thank you so much. I just I, to Elliot, Max, and Pedro. I just heard one, one of my best um, insights on in, insightful takes on NFT blockchains, and I'm very excited to see all of those opportunities. And then to everyone please enter your email in the form so that we can follow up with you guys and also follow Impact NFT Alliance on Instagram so that we can have future communications. And also I have I have seen some very exciting um, exciting things coming up from the chat. Like you guys are introducing yourself and introducing your context to us. It is a great opportunity to, to like connect with people and network. So. Next, we are going to invite you all to submit your questions or tell us more about what you're doing. I will start calling some, calling you guys from um, calling on those who have submitted their um, introductions to the chat or questions to the chat. Um, so, how about let's start with um, Hafiz? Yes, I, I see you have some amazing experiences. Do you want to unmute yourself and start um, asking questions or introducing what you are doing to us? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So hi, everyone. This is Hafiz Jawad. I'm actually from Pakistan. I'm a climate activist, a member of Yongo. I was also one of the attendees of the COP26 last year. I also served as a COE16 country coordinator last year. And apart from that, I'm also working on other SDGs like SDG4 with UNSTSN, Sustainable Development Solutions Network. So uh, most of my work is on climate and other SDGs. So I am really curious to know about all the latest technologies and blockchain is one of them. I got the chance to work on it uh, at my home country with some institution so yeah I, I had the idea about blockchain cryptocurrency and nft but i'm still trying to learn more about the mining process and how uh, it, it can be make you know less energy uh, intensive and how it can be linked with the climate and so this was really a needful insight for me i'm going to research more on this topic and i will be happy to connect with you everyone so we can learn more thank you thank you and if you guys have more questions please submit in the chat and now i see a hand shamu, shamu could you tell me how to pronounce your name yeah i can't ask i can't ask a question yeah, you can ask go ahead go ahead shamu. Yeah. okay i want uh, i am shamuel gusharmi from israel I am social activist here, and I want uh, to ask you next uh, a question. Uh, I want to ask you about social uh, aspects uh, of uh, NFT idea. And firstly, I want to ask you uh, how uh, NFT can uh, support uh, uh, resolution social problems uh, and uh, reducing uh, so Socially, despite this, yeah. Uh, so, so I heard some of that, Shmuel. I, I, I didn't hear the full of it, but I th think that's uh, what you said was something like, um, uh, "How do we solve social problems uh, with impact NFTs, and uh, yeah, what kind yeah, of, of, course, um, of, course, of course. yeah, what kind of opportunities available for that?" Right. So. So let me uh, respond to that really quickly. So to me, you know, one of the key um, things that I think really, you know, sort of underscores this entire process is the idea that a lot of things that are good for the world don't actually have commercial value easily. So carbon is a good example. For 20 years, we've talked about trying to make companies stop emitting CO2 until we put a price on carbon. These companies were not able to stop. As soon as we put a price on carbon, people started paying a lot of attention. You know, these companies have now sustainability offices and people and staff who just have to figure out how to make that price, you know, as minimum as possible. So I believe there are similar opportunities in other situations. 
One of these situations, for example, is gender education. Like one of the key things actually surprisingly people found for education, sorry, for climate change mitigation actually is providing more education to uh, young girls in developing countries. And that today does not have any economic value, right? It's usually seen as a cost center, but in the long scheme of the economic development of the country, it's actually really positive. It's actually a really powerful um, um, activity. So what we want to do with the Impact NFT idea is <coughs> actually to go and find um, examples of young people being um, educated and for the educators to give them social recognition in the form of NFTs. And what that does immediately is that it actually gives them visibility for the action they've taken, right? It's not a financial payment, not yet, but it starts earmarking who are the good people. And because of the way the blockchain works, this marking is actually very public. Is it gonna be around forever? or at least until people move, remove that marking. So you have now a way to tag and attribute effort that was previously invisible, that's completely visible. Now, the second thing that's really exciting is actually this idea of an airdrop. So an airdrop is once your particular NFT, uh, once your particular identity on the blockchain has been marked, people can actually choose to send you specific rewards. And I'll give you a very specific example. So there was an NFT recently that launched and every person who bought it later on, a, year, a month later, got a second NFT that also was worth economic money. So essentially, you're being given free money based on whether or not you have it in your wallet or not. So if we can think of the very simple program of saying, okay, all the people who go out and teach young children, uh, especially female uh, children, um, we give them the teacher NFT mark, and then we go and do uh, like a charity campaign and the money raised from the charity goes to actually to be airdropped to those contributors. We know precisely who to give money to. And that act of transferring costs zero dollars middlemen. There's no one in between taking a cut. 100% of the money goes there. That's powerful. Right? That is just one small example of the general constituency concept of actually, one, making visible actions that are valuable. Two, being able to identify who specifically are those people. And three, being able to give them very targeted very high efficiency, low loss um, rewards. Does that make sense, Shmuel? Yeah, thank you very much. Great. And there's, there's these questions are excellent. You know, like I, I, I to me, whenever I um, give one of these talks, um, I really, you know, I'm concerned about questions at the end because whether or not, if there, if there are questions, then, um, then it means people listened. If there's no questions at the end, it means that people are just on their Zoom, like playing a video game or something or watching Netflix and just you know, showing their beautiful uh, profile pictures. So I'm really happy that people are asking questions. Yeah. Um, uh, Sehaj, do you want to say something about your uh, startup? Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, so uh, like, I'm very happy to join uh, this forum, you know, uh, particularly I've uh, previously worked as an operations facilitator with uh, the children and youth constituency to the UN environment program. Uh, and I'm very happy that, you know, I got the opportunity to learn more about NFT uh, and, you know, all these things that are happening. Uh, we often, you know, in this whole, uh, uh, in the whole world, there's not, not many much information about, you know, how uh, we as young people could leverage uh, these technologies, you know, unless we learn, unless we go and join these courses, uh, go through rigorous trainings. Uh, as an organization, as a startup founder, uh, you know, I have worked previously with so many artists, uh, you know, uh, and previously with my engagement with other organizations like Museum for the United Nations. One thing that I particularly find uh, very fascinating is that, you know, and also after listening to Pedro, you know, he was talking about uh, we need more uh, you know, people and leadership and more people to join uh, and create these solutions, right? So now uh, one thing that obviously goes in my mind is that, you know, uh, that uh, there's a less communication, you know, there's a lot of reports out there, a lot of reports from IPCC, UN panels, they're churning out reports like anything, you know, all these uh, scientists. But one thing that goes, uh, you know, one thing that lacks is that, you know, these reports 
uh, or these uh, special communication that the the world the top most scientists wants to communicate to the uh, youth and to the general population is is some somewhere it gets trickled down and we do do not understand that you know what's going wrong with our uh, world with our current world with our current lifestyles you know uh, how how unsustainable like those lifestyles are uh, so in that race you know we as a startup you know we are trying to uh, currently create we are we have created more than 90 tracks and we are working on with artists in india right now uh, uh, i i i this project is not out but we are trying to uh, leverage the technologies and understand you know how we could uh, you know uh, give the best of the platform to these artists you know who we are planning to work with and i personally also created a track you can search with my name earth rave i have created a track learned this in the process and became myself as a producer you know to understand how i could be an artist to uh, radically radically raise the environmental consciousness you know which could uh, be a differentiator because i have tried all my ways you know as an in, on an individual level uh working on the policy side working on different sides i have particularly given up like i it's no more for me to sit on those forums and uh, constantly bang my head and bang other people's head uh so the only way i feel is that you know we need people who are on the creative side and uh, even unesco last year has uh, you know, uh, was dedicated to the International Year of Creative Economy. So I think it would be very good, you know, to work on the uh, the creative side and you know push uh, the NFTs towards a creative creating a co creative community is you know is is going to be a, a huge uh, sub, you know substantive uh, differentiator for uh, for people to understand and to uh, to uh, realize the importance of these technologies in terms of the climate change in terms of the biodiversity loss and uh, in terms of uh, as simple as the waste management uh, that is going on with our uh, in our cities right now so so i wanted to know if you people are open to collaboration so i could send you more details about uh, my project uh, that I'm uh, working on in uh, from the southern city of Chennai right now. And you can also give your inputs about the my opinions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was that was amazing, Sahaj, and I uh, really appreciate that sharing. You know, I think, um, you know, one, definitely love to have your organization be part of the Impact NFT Alliance. It's a, it's essentially open call, act, you know, call, call to action. So, you know, if as long as people are actually doing something useful in the space, they're not like a, uh, you know, a charlatan or fraud, like, you know, we, we're sort of open with open arms um, for that. Um, and then on the note about the artist side, I can't agree more. I feel like actually, you know, art is such a common unification of, of um, messaging in a way that uh, even like language and like culture and sometimes politics is not. So I really believe that uh, this is going to be a, a powerful way to, to sort of do, do this in, in good detail. Um, I just want to give a few more people with hands up, Ken and um, Ellie from SX to respond, even you can respond to Sihaj as well. Um, but, you know, please, like, I want to use the end of this actually for everyone else on the call just to share it yourself. This is actually to me the, the most part, the most exciting part of the whole, whole, whole experience. Um, hi, my name is Lamis. I'm studying MSc Environmental Futures with Climate Change at Essex this year. And I just want to ask, like, uh, because you were talking about, uh, like, the um, like how, how are you planning to go with the policies to spread uh, the import the enforcement of NFT uh, in, in the whole globe or, or like on a larger scale? Um, and what is actually affecting uh, the inequality part of like spreading the NFT um, and like the inclusivity to the global South, I guess? Uh, so yeah, I just, like I want to ask, like what what is the policy that is blocking the spread of NFT, and like uh, why why is it not included in 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 the whole globe yet? Yeah, I know some some of the answers, but like I want to like hear from you like better because you, you of course you will know better because um, you have done the research for the topic. Uh, but yeah, this is my question. Fantastic. So um, one thing that uh, I want to highlight here is that, you know, our whole philosophy, right, and LA going to uh, Rwanda actually to attend ITU, like we really believe in actually being um, uh, front 
engagement focused with the global south right and a lot of the you know philosophy we have in terms of accessibility and other stuff like if you don't have internet it's going to be hard for you to participate i mean that's like just table stakes but if you do have internet like we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you to participate you don't have to actually have a lot of money you don't have to actually have expenditure of finances in order to participate um to the point about you know where where the um uh dissemination of knowledge is you know, I really believe that uh, it comes from the small positive feedback loops that happen when people discover a new thing, they participate, they get something immediately valuable out of it, and now this gives them the confidence to do more. Uh, and I think in this particular case, the action of either making your own, first getting your own NFT, receiving it, being able to show it to your people, look, it's real, you know, it's not just a, 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 a term on the internet, it's actually physically here. Second is then getting value from owning it. And third is then being able to make your own and actually give it to other people. This suddenly goes from zero of like just reading about some concept to now becoming like a part of the extended community. And this rabbit hole, that is the Web3 rabbit hole, it is deep and it is powerful. Um, meaning that if you fall into it, uh, you'll find you know, an incredible adventure. It's actually as exciting as the UN global adventure, except for the fact that um, uh, there is uh, you don't have to wait for people to give you permission. Anything you want to do, you could just start doing immediately. And usually people want to give you money and resources for free to help you do it. Like, think about that, right? Like, imagine if you said, you know, I want to do a climate gathering in my hometown. Like, chances are the UN is not going to give you that money. Like, unfortunately, because the UN also doesn't have a lot of money. But if you have, if you want to say, I want to do a Web3 gathering in my hometown that also happens to touch climate change, there are people who are going to give you 5,000 US dollars for free. And, and that sounds crazy, but I'm going to prove it to you. And after this call, like, you know, hopefully everyone has their emails and you can have Eray's email. We're going to run a, a program where actually we're going to get someone, one of the big public chains to give $5,000 to someone actually running climate, you know, Web3 education in whatever country you're in. Uh, and I think that experience is going to help you guys feel like this revolution is actually happening right at your doorstep. So. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, but I just want to like, know the connection between the NFT and the AI and how is it connected to AI ethics policies nowadays? So as of today, it's not directly. Um, there's an organization called Effective Altruism, which is actually very focused on AI safety and risk. One of our investors actually is, uh, he donated $10 million to build the Future Humanity Institute at Cambridge to focus specifically on AI ethics. And he also invests in crypto. But the overlap today is actually not enough. There needs to be more intellectual and philosophical and computer science work actually to put the two together. Um, I actually had a five hour conversation last night about this particular topic. So if this is a topic that you wanna have more conversations with, you can write to me you know, in, independently and I can put you in touch with the people who are having this conversation uh, in the world. Uh, okay, so one last thing. So uh, I just wanted to ask, like, if if it's if it will help to have this uh, partnerships between uh, countries who are leading the initiatives uh, for AI, and the countries who are who have like the 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 initiatives but are not like um, as like as a huge number of the initiatives of the 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 global north, for example, like for the US or um, the UK, they have a lot of uh, AI initiatives, but then, or like other countries, but the, like these countries have uh, the most initiatives for AI. And then for example, countries in, in Africa and like the Middle East, they have also initiatives, but it's not uh, like as many as the, 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 uh, these countries. Like if there is partnership that may happen between these countries, would this, uh, close the gap between um, what, what the AI is trying to do and what is, what is doing, what is it, it is doing right now? So um, one thing that we want to do with AI that's not being done today, but I think it actually could be quite interesting to do actually is to create conversational AI that will actually be tied to the health of the indigenous land and people of which the AI represents. So today there are chatbots. Basically there are uh, AI that can talk to people and look like it's talking as a human would, but we can actually program it to not only represent a particular human, but a forest or a tree or an animal or a river. 
And you can actually have dialogue with an AI that represents a natural element. So if you watch these, you know, sort of movies where we give names to the land we live on, we give spirits, you know, presence in, in the way we respect nature, like using AI, we can actually make that into reality. And, and that's something that I think is going to come in the near future. Uh, in fact, we're working on one of these projects right now, but hopefully other people also do the same thing. So uh, just for interest of time, like we should definitely talk more about AI, but uh, I think you're hitting on some of the key topics and key uh, innovation points to really uh, think through. Um, yeah. Um, anyone else? Um, Dylan, oh, he has to go. Is anyone who hasn't spoken who wants to say hi really quickly? Maybe Bethany, if you're there, or Ken? Hi, everyone. That's, Ken has four books on Amazon. Okay, go ahead, <laughs> Bethany. Yeah, my name is Bethany. I am from Haiti. I am in, I'm working in climate. And so I have studied um, agriculture engineer. Um, so I'm now the, the director of a gemplasm center where we producing seedlings for reforestation. It's good to be here with you. You're producing seedlings, like seeds, like physical seeds. Yes, yes. Wow, okay. That's so cool. <laughs> Can you show Thank us pictures you. of that? Do you have pictures of that? Um, um, no, I don't have pictures now on my phone, but I can send you some later. Great. Okay, no problem. Awesome. Okay, yeah. great. So last call for anyone who wants to speak up before we end the call. Hi. Hi. Yeah. It's great to be here. Even though I didn't join on time, but when I came, I was able to learn a whole lot. It is quite interesting. I just wish we'll be having it more often than, than now. I'm Ken from Nigeria. I'm a member of Yongo. Uh, one of the challenges, let me just quickly uh, just say one of the things we observe here. One of a, a young leading voices in climate here in Africa. In Africa here, we are still at the basic of letting people understand what climate change is. I know over there people might be talking about net zero, decarbonization, and a whole lot of that. But here we are almost the first generation by our, uh, leading the movement here. So what I'm asking is, is there any way we can as an engage you guys with regards to the NFT of a thing? Is there any way it has to go hand in hand with local uh, activism and awareness first? Because we've not started talking about uh, a green energy or green job. We are still talking about uh, awareness because most times when you tell somebody about climate change here, it's almost something that is strange to most persons. So we are still uh, at that level here. We've not gone uh, to the advanced stage. So at this level that we are about activism and awareness, is there any way this NFT of a thing can really help us? And is there any way we can also carry our people along to make sure that we keep uh, this great movement going? Yeah, that's 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 absolutely amazing, Ken. And, uh, and I think that uh, your um, insights about Africa, I think are very much needed. To me, you know, this is like, this is um, knowledge that uh, are crucial actually for, for the work that we do. Um, and uh, I really hope that, uh, you know, as we do more of these kind of just, you know, like gatherings online, that uh, I wanna give you a stage just to share actually what, what is the, you think like what, what you think are actually the specific um, milestones or even like thinking that needs to be done actually to sort of make climate change Africa more real. Because I feel like one of the key things that I see, and this is just me, my bias, is that people in the, in the developed countries have a very vague understanding of how acute climate change actually is in developing countries. They think that like, oh, if it's too hot, we can just turn on air conditioning. But like if, you know, people are living on their farms and they're growing their own food and then it doesn't rain for, you know, six months, like, like that is affecting the day-to-day -day nourishment, right? I'm not saying that's in your case, but like that's just like things that I've seen firsthand. And I think that actually changes the prioritization of where the urgency is. So being able to actually tell more compelling stories from, from the front lines, I think is, is really key to, to this whole thing. Yeah. Um, last one, I see Njango has a hand up. Um, you wanna say anything? Yeah, hi, how's everyone doing? My name is 
Django Njunge from Kenya, also a member of Yango, and I do social media advocacy for a think tank in Nairobi called Power Shift Africa. And I also do crypto fundraising for an organization known as Friends of Bonobos. And I think part of why I really enjoyed this conversation is that in my line of work, the question of why does an environment organization accept crypto really comes up because of the um, mm -hmm. of the environment impact and listening to the, the newest argument about proof of work to proof of stake was really you know exciting to know and I hope Ethereum goes that way as well as soon as possible. Uh, really great talk. Hope, hopefully we'll talk more in later um, convenings and it was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Django. Thank you. And I want to hear more about your crypto fundraising. That sounds excellent. You, you, have, a, you, have, you have a lot of exciting things there. So guys, thank you so much. Iray, you're amazing to hoax this. You know, really appreciate your help. And Elliot as well to you know, also step in last time when I was sick with an emergency. I couldn't uh, be here online. Um, all of you guys, each one you know, specifically to come uh, and give your knowledge and sharing here. Uh, and finally, um, this is not the... Uh, conclusion of the chat. This is just uh, an opener. Uh, we'll, we'll do more of these. Um, and overall, like uh, we hope that you guys feel that there's tooling available to really drive climate change at a global scale using crypto and Web3 and blockchain. And don't be afraid of it. Be uh, very aware. Use it responsibly. Um, and at the same time, you know, uh, think about how you guys can, um, what, what kind of things you need to upgrade yourselves so that this Next time we have this chat, which is maybe in a month from now, um, we actually can focus on the needs you guys have and then showing you where crypto can actually be useful for that particular need. So with that, we'll send you guys all away. Have a wonderful Sunday day evening um, and uh, we'll hopefully see you guys soon. Yeah, And I'll put my LinkedIn here as well so you guys can find me on the internet. Uh, if you haven't um, seen the website for Impact NFT Alliance, I encourage you to do so. There's a mailing list as well. Um, and there's a lot of resources and videos online. Uh, we'll actually record this video. We already did it. Um, you already did. And we'll sort of put it on YouTube at some point in the near future. See you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.